Welcome to um, the HL Data Architecture talk. Um, so, first thing I'm going to talk a little bit about me uh, so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, in 2015, uh, I started to really work with data. I've done uh, a year of Kaggle competitions, and uh, at the end of the year, I managed to become a Kaggle master, actually, also competing together with some of the top Kagglers. That was a really fun experience. Um, in 2016, I joined a company in the Netherlands called CoolBlue, where I started to work on the data warehouse and also the data engineering part. Um, uh, I also looked at uh, a project called uh, Apache Airflow at the time, and since 2015, I'm maintaining a site called uh, ETL, Best Practices for Airflow. And from that experience, I really started to look uh, at data warehousing in a slightly different perspective, because you have the old BI, but with data engineering, you have also a newer way to make uh, data warehouses. And um, I lived in Brazil for a while, that's, you know, that's what the hat uh, is about. Um, and when I was on the beach, I started to also think about the software complexity it, uh, itself, where, you know, what makes software really complex and uh, how can we find ways to make it uh, less complex and make it more manageable. So, the first question is uh, definition of an agile data warehouse. Uh, what really constitutes an agile data warehouse? Um, when does it become agile? And I think the real answer to that is uh, when you're able to manage uh, the technical debt, because uh, when agile processes and agile projects really go wrong, is you see that uh, they are have been unable to keep technical debt to a minimum. And specifically for data warehouses, that is related to a number of key concepts that I'm going to highlight today. So, first of the things that you see in data warehouses is that there is um, a very direct transformation from your uh, source systems. Uh, here we see uh, a simple OLTP system that, which can be transaction-based, which gets uh, transformed rather immediately to facts and dimensions. And uh, there's a couple of things that are introduced from that because of the, the way how the uh, source system is set up can actually have an, uh, an effect, has a direct effect on the way how your data warehouse is structured. So. One of the other things about the lock-in that you have is when you look at uh, styles in data warehouses uh, methodologies like Kimball, is that you need to make uh, design choices very upfront. So when you start a project, you need to de uh, decide if this is a slowly changing dimension type one or type two. And then later on, when some of those um, uh, the design decisions need to change because of business changes. Uh, it is very difficult. Uh, you have to do, make a lot of effort in order to refer those design choices later on. So. Uh, one of the other things related to complexity is uh, what you see when you go straight to a Kimball model is that the complexity of the intermediate work becomes very large. And the reason why that is because in uh, older BI um, data warehouses, um, you would not really want to duplicate a lot of the data. So you end up uh, writing a lot of the logic into views and into source queries that really become larger over time. And I've seen queries that are easily 1,200 lines of SQL code. So if you are challenged later on to make changes to all of that logic, it becomes completely unmanageable. Um, the other things that come up, for, uh, especially for companies that have uh, very high growth, are the data volumes. Um, so uh, there are, at some point you have processing stages that in the beginning it takes one hour, but if you have companies that grow with 40% on a yearly basis, the initial data varies that it was with some um, calculations that can be exponential in nature, they will easily lead to um, uh, failures to meet the SLA. So I've seen cases where this can go up to 11 o'clock in the morning to take about uh, 11 hours of processing. Um, because the data volume increases, the users that are connected to the, DB, uh, to the database of the warehouse immediately, the power users, they have uh, long waiting times and they are going to have uh, problems also uh, querying the data because some of the other reporting data may be um, uh, running at the same time. And that's also for the reports. Uh, reports can at some point be implemented to go over large amounts of data, and that creates a lot of strain on the data warehouse. And together with the users that want to access it in real time, uh, is going to create a, a data warehouse that is uh, difficult to, to work with. So, um, one of the things that is really important for a data warehouse is, um, in, in order to keep the complexity at a minimum, is to think about reproducibility of what you're building. Um, um, this is a sort of related to the immutability that you have as a data warehouse. Uh, a lot of Kimball data warehouses are in 
principle um, 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 immutable, but you will see that a number of operations that you uh, operate on that data uh, will eventually become, uh, will treat it as a mutable data warehouse. So um, a, a good challenge to go into is to think about uh, if I have uh, some data that I have in, for example, a persistent store, a staging area, will I be able to regenerate my entire data warehouse using different rules, using different logic, uh, all the way from the start of when my data started to stream in. Uh, when you're able to do that, then you're able to deal with all the design um, um, constraints that are going to be imposed on you or the decisions that you have to make. And through reproducibility, uh, you're going to have a much easier time to solve bugs. So if there are issues that come up because the data looks strange or something else didn't get processed, if you have uh, immutable partitions that you're working with, uh, you're going to be able very easily to de detect where these uh, differences were introduced and uh, uh, work on that logic. So. Uh, another thing that uh, came up with uh, data warehouses that are uh, complicated is the, the ETL tooling that you're using. Um, yesterday I uh, did a, a workshop on Apache Airflow and I uh, explained uh, some of the really good benefits and the philosophy that is behind this project if you use it properly. So some of the ETL tooling that I looked at was, for example, uh, SSIS or uh, there were some other tools like Azkaban, but uh, some of them are focused on a specific database. So then instead of just using any tool out there that you would like to use, you're forced to use SQL Server. Um, so some of the uh, tooling are not very easily scalable because they run on one particular server or you have like a bunch of cron jobs in particular places. And um, uh, the, the biggest problem that you would have is that they are difficult to synchronize with other scheduled pipelines. So if you imagine that you have your ETL pipeline in your new data warehouse and you want to uh, run your uh, pipelines through that, there will be other cases where some other data comes in from a different system and then you have the challenge of trying to synchronize the operations that you have when these and, and merging these data pipelines together. And um, the, some of the ETL tooling that you have seen um, isn't built from this functional philosophy that I'm going to talk about uh, tomorrow, uh, building the, uh, designing um, the ETL uh, pipelines using Apache Airflow. And functional philosophy basically means that you're going to treat the data operations that you are uh, using and executing as um, functional uh, programming, in, in a functional programming style. That means that you're going to avoid side effects and you're going to think of um, immutable data sets where the output of your uh, function in your ETL only depends on the input and not on the actual state that might already be there. And of course you have the, uh, the problem that it might not be extendable as a platform. So. Uh, some, uh, ET or some ETL tools give you a couple of uh, components and a couple of things that you can use to get started. But eventually you will see that you're going to want to use some other different components that you would like to have in your uh, ETL uh, pipeline, maybe for transformations. And if you're not able to extend that, then uh, you're stuck. And I think uh, Apache Uzi is one of those examples where you have some EXML uh, capabilities. But beyond those capabilities, it is very difficult to extend the platform and thereby you're going to be limited in the, the, the actions that you're able to perform. So uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about now is that um, in, in engineering, um, it is actually a methodolog methodological process where you have your skills that you need to have, but you also need to know, know exactly when you do some things and what you, when you do certain things, uh, when you do not want, uh, do certain things, right? So um, besides uh, working big data, I'm also doing a little bit of painting. And what that teaches me is that from uh, the process of painting, it gives you an insight, a visual insight into the... the um, the, the differences that uh, these particular concepts make. Uh, what you do in each stage really matters. So, for example, um, this is a painting that I did some time ago. Uh, here you see a concept, um, and this concept is basically about the expression of a human being, right? Later on, what we add is the contextualization, and this is where you finish the drawing and you give some kind of insight into, uh, well, what, where this person is located and, and what kind of instruments they use. And um, when that is done, you, um, you have an underlayer of the painting. So you don't start with uh, painting uh, the painting right away with paint from the left bottom corner, but you, you build this up in stages. And with the underlayer, you do the, the black and the white and the lights differently. 
and eventually what you have is a finished underlayer, which is basically uh, going from the concept to a more generalized idea about what the painting is going to be. Uh, the next stage is when you paint the final layer. This is where you really start painting with the oil paint. So you could uh, think of that as going into production. But usually what you end up with is that you use too much paint, too much code. So the next stage is going to be that there's a reductive approach. You're going to take away the code that you didn't need uh, in the end. And or in this case, I just removed some of the paint that wasn't necessary. Uh, the next stage is when you add some of the color. So that's where you can uh, get some more... Uh, um, ideas about the, the, the chroma and so on, because we have been working in black and white uh, from the start. And in the very end, uh, you can see that uh, this is the finished painting. And in the, on the left side, you see the concept that you started from. So this is uh, like um, an analogy of uh, bringing concept from uh, your ID all the way to something in production where it starts to uh, live its own life. So um, the agile data architecture is um, um, has some of these very important characteristics. Uh, if, you know, if there's a key slide, this is probably the one. Uh, I think if you want to go towards the agile data architecture, these are the things you need to focus on. So one of them is the, you need to choose the good ETL tools that have generalized reusable components. It means that you do not want to use components in there that have already a lot of your uh, logic in them and that have uh, some of the application-specific things in them. You want to use those components in different pipelines. Therefore, they have to be generalized enough, but um, abstract enough so that it solves all the problem of dealing with that particular operation. And reusability is, uh, is I think, uh, well, that's the key keyword in there. Um, the design decisions that you take uh, need to be taken at the right stage. Just as in the painting, you don't want to start painting all the way right from the start, but you need, want to think about where are you going to perform all these different operations. So we're talking about ETL, but you can also think about ELT, for example. And um, it is very important not to do that too early and just uh, try to delay that, uh, defer those further backwards because I see, especially in data warehousing, that the more you try to push those design decisions backwards, it gives you more flexibility in the future. Um, we talked about functional data pipelines already, so you, you want to try to have a, a data pipeline that when you extract data from your sources and you have those mutable partitions, that you're able to carry all of that forward through all the different transformations. And that sometimes you want to push that into a different kind of schema so that it makes it easier to extract it later. And um, having these reproducible pipelines allows it that basically uh, is already created when you have those immutable partitions in place because um, it's going to solve a number of problems. If you do not work with um, immutable partitions, you're always working with data that is rather fluid in nature. Um, it is also important to find ways to decouple the source schema from your warehouse schema. And the reason why that is the case is um, if you imagine that you have an OLTP transactional database and uh, people, they, they see there is a need in the business to change it, then um, you're being, uh, you can become a bottleneck in the whole process of those changes because the data that you have in your warehouse schema is going to be, um, you, know, you need to make some, some changes that are necessary there in the whole process. And um, that, is, um, that, that can become quite, you know, you can become the bottleneck for the upstream people that are trying to make those changes. And it can also be that some of the projects, products in your data warehouse are going to break because of it. So uh, an interesting thing that came uh, along with big data is that um, we used to think about having multiple copies of the same data in uh, an older school uh, BI database as a bread practice because you consume a lot of storage. Therefore, you have a lot of um, aggregation of logic together in the same uh, operation. And I, I think uh, big data gives us a lot more storage that isn't necessarily a big problem. So if you think of uh, trying to make use of that and split up your logic into separate steps, you're making your whole process uh, a lot more manageable. So. What I'm suggesting here is an idea I've been uh, experimenting with. And you can actually see that on the side of ETL with Airflow in, uh, in the big data example. Um, in this uh, overall data pipeline, I'm going to be using a data lake as the source for my uh, uh, data warehouse. Uh, I'm going to manage the data that I extract to use a persistent staging area. The persistent staging area is basically uh, a location where all the raw data gets stored without too many modifications. So basically, the, the data as is from the source systems. And I will be using a data fault architecture. Data fault is uh, 
still not widely adopted, but I think it is uh, incredibly useful in terms of the, the thinking that goes behind it. And from the raw data fault, we go to a business data fault, which is the step where the business rules get applied. And from the business rules, uh, we go eventually to a star schema. So um, what you will see in Kimball, for example, is that the whole data fault um, is skipped. You know, we would have a, a couple of uh, simple operations in between them to go directly to a star schema. So the, just to explain what a data fault is in a, in a very low way, um, uh, in a data fault, you will see that when you have a simple uh, uh, transactional database with customers and products and orders, that uh, you you have a couple of more tables to deal with. So it sounds as if you're going to increase the complexity. But what you see happening here is that uh, you have the hubs, like entities of a customer and of a product, that are being linked together from uh, relational uh, tables in between there. And everything in this uh, schema is ma has many to many relationships. And it has uh, a very good um, intention in the sense that um, uh, if anything in the source system changes, because there's no longer a one-to-many, but a many-to-many -many or a many-to-one relationship, uh, it is already modeled in your data fault. So you don't need to make any design changes. Um, then you have, uh, as the detailed information, those are the satellites at the bottom. And the satellites at the bottom, they really contain all the specifics about what is located in those um, entities. So that is basically a, a very brief explanation what the, the data fault model is about. Uh, it allows you to consume your OWTP transactional data, bring it into a different structure where you have to follow the methodology, and from there you'll be able to uh, build your um, end products a, li a little bit easier. Um, so for example, um, here we have the hub customer, and in data fault, um, it is um, already a practice that um, if you have multiple systems that are uh, having some kind of customer in them, you will be basically be adding more satellites for each, each uh, subsystem that you have. But you will always tie it back to the hub. So if you at some point need to uh, bring those uh, customers together, you can run a separate algorithm to uh, understand what these uh, satellites, uh, how they are related to one another. So you're decomposing a problem into uh, a structural um, uh, environment, a structural schema, which is the data fault, instead of running uh, some uh, SQL that is really difficult to follow uh, afterwards. So, the first thing that we would do in this case is to break data into reloadable partitions, because we want to have those immutable partitions, as I was talking about, uh, uh, talking about earlier. So if you imagine that you have a transactional database, uh, like a cloud SQL database, uh, and you extract the artifacts from that, what I mean with extracting artifacts is that instead of extracting tables separately, you extract the data from that as if they are the um, artifacts that you would have in a, a normal, actual life um, environment. So, for example, um, in data warehousing, you're just talking about the business processes that underlie the transactional process. And uh, when you have an invoice, you have this paper that you generate, and on that paper you have the customer, you have the, the, the invoice lines, you have some more invoice data. If you try to extract uh, all of the data that is related together as one document, you're able to uh, better manage uh, the data afterwards, because you're able to um, uh, bring out the links together with that. So if you imagine that uh, we are not just extracting tables there, but we're extracting documents from the database, invoices, uh, shipping delivery documents, uh, uh, orders, and so on, then we're going to push all those documents into a, a data lake um, environment that you see over there in the middle. Then you see like a, a loopback diagram over there. And that lookup diagram is basically for when you have the full dumps um, of tables, because some tables aren't versioned. And what that process does is to identify the changes that have really occurred in those tables. And then it will uh, add some uh, data fault specific attributes, the, the low DTM and the record source. And it will only push the changes back into the data lake. Uh, for the other um, route, when you split the entities into the data fault model, you're going to read from the data lake environment. Uh, you're going to read all those documents, and then in the documents, you want to split out the customers and the orders and uh, all the other information back into the, the way how your data fault model is organized. Sometimes you will see situations that in OLTP, there were uh, choices that were made to model uh, tables in a specific way for performance reasons. Uh, but when you think about the, the way how uh, what an order looks like, it is a more of a logical document. 
and then you have some other transformation steps that are necessary to go back from your artifact document that you created into a more uh, data warehouse logical uh, way of, of representing that. So um, what the output of all of this is basically the PSA. The PSA is the persistent storage area, and that's where for every day all the changes go for the data warehouse. Some of the data that you extract uh, might already be applicable to the PSA, uh, so you can extract it directly, uh, but most of the data will probably go through that loop to um, uh, extract per data fault table uh, what the necessary uh, uh, inputs are. So here we see then uh, what that looks like if you have a, a more accurate representation of the data lake and this process. Um, you would have a, a data lake with uh, some uh, names to indicate what uh, what the location is and what the, the subsystems are, and um, and also the, the customer and the product tables. Uh, all of these uh, Afro documents I chose for the Afro format. Um, they are going eventually to be loaded into the data fault, uh, the raw data fault itself. And uh, when you work with these partitions, you can see with the blue arrows and the red arrows that they're all sort of bound together. So you need to think about uh, that this is a process where uh, when you have multiple input sources, you're reading from each partition separately. So that means that you can run the, all of this process completely in parallel, instead of that you, when you run uh, with a, a, a whole bunch of data as input, that you need to wait for that full run to complete before, before you can run another uh, run for it. right? So b by having it separated into a partition, you're making your ETL process also parallelizable. So where we are right now is the data lake. Uh, we have loaded our extracts into the P PSA. And what we're going to do now is going to load uh, what is in the PSA into the data fold. And that is basically that, that works like this. We have our uh, documents, and that can be um, CSV or it can be JSON, whatever uh, uh, the, the, the system that you implement data fold in, uh, uh, on accepts. I have chosen for Hive in my example because I think that's a, a useful, uh, as a useful SQL interface, but it can also work on BigQuery just as uh, easily. Um, the staging uh, table that I cr dynamically create has a tag on it at the end of which is the date. So you keep also there, you keep all the data together. And then from that staging database in uh, another uh, operation, you're loading it from the staging database into your um, final uh, raw data fault tables. So here you have the, the hub tables and you have the satellite tables. There are some instructions how you do that for data fault as a methodology in the data fault book. And then you do that for all those entities. So you have your uh, data fault model, which can be a large number of tables. And then you run all those pipelines to get the data loaded uh, in there. And um, in theory, what you can do, huh, we, we, we talked about Airflow yesterday about uh, intervals that you would normally probably pick uh, uh, a date or a day for this. But you can run this at 15 minute intervals uh, just as well. So if you have data that gets refreshed more, you choose a different interval and you load the data in uh, at a more uh, faster rate. And still all of all those operations, they can run uh, together in parallel. What we have also established with these operations is that our source schema, how it was represented, is completely decoupled from uh, our target schemas. So uh, if we have changes in our uh, source system, we will be able to, to uh, keep the customer table. And if there are significant changes, we can decide to create another satellite customer table that is going to be used for data that is after these uh, design changes in the source system. So that means that um, instead of having a specific staging table where you have to apply the changes as well on a particular date uh, when the source system changes, you can just um, keep running and, and do work ahead in tor in to, be, uh, to already get ready for when those systems are going to be in place uh, at the source system. So what we have now is the raw data fault and, uh, the, in the overall architecture. We have loaded the data into there. And what the next steps that they're going to do is the most um, well, interesting, probably, because uh, from the raw data fault, we are now supposed to be doing all the calculations and do all the, the, the operations on analytics where we are going to uh, generate uh, all the value. And in uh, the business fault, you would have um, a couple of uh, tables that are useful for that. One of them is the PID table. Uh, the PID table is a point in time table that helps you to align the the, the dates when something was valid on the, so on, the, on the source together. I'll show you how that works uh, later. And there are bridge tables that help you to create like uh, accesses on where you join the table, uh, the data together. 
For example, um, if you have a order line that gets created, then it is useful from a um, margin perspective to understand what the warehouse costs were for that particular order line. And the only way how you can uh, deal with that is when you make a connection from the order itself, when it was sold on the invoice, when it came into the warehouse on the delivery, on which order it was created and how that uh, was invoiced from the supplier. So that means that you make a rather large um, combination of, a, of an, an access table where you're going to have links from that particular order line to all these different um, documents and artifacts that were being created. So when you use a bridge table, you'll be able to work with that and then you can link to all these different uh, um, satellite tables to extract more information to calculate your margins, for example. So, uh, well, the other thing that is the customer deduplication, and that is more of a data quality uh, incentive. Um, when you have all the data available, you can run sub-processes to be able to identify which customers are the same, so that you can use that in the future as well as a way to, um, um, to better allocate particular costs or, or uh, other things to the, to the customer. So here's an example of the, uh, the PIT table. Uh, the PIT table uh, is basically uh, a table that is used to understand when you have a question for a particular day, uh, which record in the source table was actually uh, active. So if you think about uh, name, address and contact and compensation and sell some as uh, separate tables that you have in your uh, business fold, then at some point when you ask a question, uh, what the status was as a, at a particular day. You don't want to create queries where you have that complication of selecting the right record from your source tables. So the, the PIT table allows you to, uh, to really understand when these changes took place. And it is um, a table where you can also query, for example, if there was an address change uh, for this particular customer, um, how the, uh, what were the other valid records at that particular time. So you can really skip and go through the whole timeline for uh, a particular context, uh, contextual situation. And this is an example of the bridge table, a very uh, easy one. Um, here is where you, you need to imagine that this can be like six different tables uh, all linked together. And this is where you just create a uh, uh, a structure in which you don't have to make all those different joins together. So instead of joining all those tables and scanning through all of them, you create a uh, sort of like an anchor table where you're already going to be able to pinpoint all these different uh, records uh, right from the start. So that will reduce uh, a lot of the I.O. Uh, processing times. So in the overall architecture, is uh, we have now uh, looked at the business data fault. Uh, that is where you create all the value, where all the, the stuff in the data warehouse comes together. And then we have the star schema, which is basically uh, generated out of the business fold directly. So when we have uh, the desirable base or like uh, uh, for all the, the business fold tables that we have created, we will now be able to um, extract the information, all the metrics that we have calculated from the business fold, and put it into a star schema for uh, visualization. So the overall architecture is... Um, is now complete. And when we then uh, look at the uh, other things, this is an important thing as well. Uh, I was talking about these concepts with uh, some colleagues. And what we determined as well is that um, you have this concept of data lanes. And data lanes are basically um, related to the source systems that you are going to ingest data from. So if you look at, for example, on the left, you have the role and salary uh, contract on this side, and you have some uh, hour time system that, that keeps track of the working hours, and you have a planning system that is supposed to match the working hours and, and to optimize for that planning, then um, the sooner you're going to merge the data together, the more complex it becomes in the future to actually make changes to that. So I've seen, especially in this particular area, uh, problems because on the HR uh, database, you would typically have uh, monthly data, and on the hours, you would have uh, hour data. And when you try to match that directly, um, the grain is completely different. And there's a lot of overlap in different records that you would have uh, in between. So what you need to try to do is to um, uh, keep these lanes of the source systems that you're ingesting uh, separate. Uh, you know, manipulate the data, transform the data as you need to do that, uh, create some intermediate metrics for that, and then only at the very last, when you have the grains matched in your own lane, then you merge all of that together. So that you get, uh, in the combination and the visualization, you only need to, uh, to do a very direct uh, link or a join between them so that you get your information out of that. That is the most uh, useful way to do that. <coughs> 
And uh, as a final uh, thing, there's um, a slide which uh, discusses a possible architecture. This is a more technical slide. Uh, we have our sources, uh, which can be from storage or database. We're going to push that into a data lake. We use the process to create our files in our persistent staging area, which are the immutable partitions uh, where data is kept. Uh, using beam processes or airflow processes, we're going to push the data into the data fold, in the raw data fold first. Using Airflow, we're then going to process data on the raw data fold, and we're going to bring that into the business fold. From the business fold, where we have calculated all the metrics and did customer deduplication and other uh, analytical processes, um, we are going to then um, push the data into a couple of data marts that could be, for example, also on BigQuery. Um, and other times, there are needs that you have more interactive data. So if you have Tableau, for example, there are some of those dashboards where you want to do, uh, allow users to click and, um, and work with the data interactively. And you cannot really do that easily with BigQuery. But because you already have a base where your uh, data is kept in BigQuery or in Hive or some other system, you're easily going to be able to uh, extract data from that and push that into uh, an interactive SQL database. And then, of course, at the very end, you have all the visualization tools and the reports and, uh, and the user interfaces. So thank you very much. That was my presentation.